Is your phone pwned? We're going to talk about uh, auditing, attacking, and defending mobile devices. Smartphones are exploding. It's a pretty exciting time, and more importantly, it's a very ex sorry. It's an exciting time to be hacking phones as well. So we're going to start off with what you all wanted to see. We're going to start by uh, attacking some phones. I'm first going to introduce us. Uh, my name is John Herring. I'm here with Kevin Mahaffey and Anthony Limeberry. Uh, we're with Flexilis. We're a mobile security uh, startup working on software. We uh, started in the research community, actually born out of DEF CON and Black Hat, and uh, decided we were going to build software to uh, defend mobile devices. So uh, let's take a look at a real world attack scenario. So I don't know if any of you have had the pleasure of working with WAP, but it's, it's very, very complicated. Uh, basically what it is, it's an application data protocol for mobile devices. And it was originally designed so you can get things like the internet on your mobile device. Um, they also have a service called WAP Push that basically allows uh, push services to be sent to your device instead of your device having to pull them. Uh, so this would save battery life, et cetera, et cetera. And so you can see that the WAP protocol stack is, is fairly complicated and somewhat reminiscent of the TCP IP protocol stack. Um, we're starting to see a lot of attacks targeted towards WAP. Um, at Black Hat this year, there were at least three attacks that went towards WAP. Um, in my opinion, the uh, state of WAP security is somewhat poor and not many people have audited it. And we hope to lower the bar to auditing mobile protocols today. So we, we hope you all take something home and, and help secure this stuff. So under normal circumstances, the way WAP works is it goes over all sorts of different data channels, but the one we're going to look at today is SMS. So when you get an SMS on your mobile phone, we're going to assume you have a GSM phone. Uh, the SMS comes through what the carrier's uh, system called the SMSC. And under normal circumstances, when you get a WAP push, the SMSC trusts a specific gateway that connects to other services. So let's imagine the carrier wants to update some settings on your phone they would use this thing called the push proxy gateway, which is the trusted person who's supposed to send WAP pushes to your phone. And your phone has configuration settings that say, hey, I only trust this push proxy gateway to receive WAP push messages. This is all secure, right, guys? So <laughs> just like you can send SMSs to your friend on the same network, this routes through the SMSC, you can also send WAP push messages to somebody else on the same network. The device should of course, say, well, this is not a trusted WAP push initiator, so you know, I'm just going to ignore this message. But on certain Windows mobile devices, they, they uh, shipped from the factory misconfigured with uh, security policy settings. And this basically says, I will trust WAP push messages from any initiator. Uh, this attack has been live in the wild since 2008. And I'm surprised it hasn't gotten more attention than it has. Uh, basically what it does, it allows unauthenticated senders to send these things called service load and service indication method messages. And what those are is it's either a way to pop up a URL on a target device or on a, on a target device you can literally install an application over the air with no user intervention. And I'll let you guys, your devious minds, think about all the wonderful things you could do with that. And so just to be clear, this isn't necessarily a Microsoft issue. It's an OEM issue. So the security policies are misconfigured by the OEMs. They're actually good when Microsoft ships them. And for some reason, they misconfigure them. We haven't figured out why that's happening. Also, just a heads up that the carriers absolutely are monitoring their networks pretty closely. And this traffic stands above the rest. So it's very easy for them to tell who's sending this type of traffic. So be aware of that. And, and so as a note, the devices that are vulnerable are Windows mobile devices uh, from a variety of manufacturers, HTC, Pantex, Samsung, Motorola, uh, et cetera. Yep. So let's take a look at the attack. So I know the screen's backwards, but you'll get the idea. So essentially what we're going to do here is Kevin's going to attack my phone. Uh, no user intervention whatsoever. I'm not touching anything. Um, we're able to force a browser open with an arbitrary URL. We could uh, combine this with a browser-based exploit. Um, also, what we could do is force an arbitrary URL to point to uh, a file and force it to download and install a file. It could be malware. It could be some kind of malicious piece of hardware. There you go. Um, he just popped open the site. It's loading. Um, and then we see uh, defcon.com is going to load up for us. So um, just, this just gives you an idea of exactly what is possible with these types of attacks. So if I would see this happening, but if this were in my pocket or if I weren't paying attention, essentially I could completely take control of the device remotely uh, and with almost no user intervention or no user intervention whatsoever. So it's a pretty cool attack. You know, there's also a lot of speculation. You know, you hear all sorts of WebKit vulnerabilities, and you know, when WebKit gets owned, it owns like everything from a PS3 to 
Android, iOS X, every version of WebKit out there. Um, so this is definitely a vector for drive-by browser exploits as well. So you pop open a web page and you can initiate that. So we are releasing a fix tool, uh, which will be available shortly at hotfix.flexless.com. Um, so basically what it does, it fixes this. There's two issues related to this, and we're going to talk about some more issues later. Uh, it's free, and basically what it does is it patches your security settings on a vulnerable device and keeps you safe. Uh, as a note, if you hard reset your device, you'll have to reinstall the fix tool because it doesn't actually hit it in the ROM. Mm -hmm. And uh, one other note to add is that if you aren't sure if you're vulnerable or not, you can use this tool to detect. It'll scan to detect if you're vulnerable. So go ahead and download that if you're worried. So let's talk about the mobile security environment. Uh, what's going on generally with devices, networks, um, everything that goes into actually attacking these devices to give some context. So we all know mobile devices are essentially PCs today. We were looking back at some of our research in Bluetooth just from a few years ago at DEF CON and kind of laughing at the primitive devices we were attacking just three years ago or so. And these devices have fundamentally changed. I mean, my iPhone is more powerful than like my first three computers I ever owned combined. And this is in my pocket, notwithstanding all the mobile protocols and technology that go into it. So what are the key factors driving the threats? Device advancement, I would say, is the number one. Third-party application adoption. I mean, we saw this on the desktop with, um, in the 90s with the shareware movement and uh, malware and spyware starting to piggyback on, on applications as they were downloaded. Um, persistent connections and mobile data usage. Uh, data usage is absolutely skyrocketing. So I just read a study, I believe, uh, by 2012, will be using the same amount of data on mobile networks as in 2008 on wired networks. And if that gives you an idea of how much data will be flowing over mobile networks, it's, it's pretty staggering in just a short period of time. So in addition to the, uh, to the threat landscape that's being driven by these, the device enhancement and mobile data, there's incentives for attackers. In-band payment mechanism is, I would say, going to be one of the biggest. So how do you monetize an attack uh, on the PC? Well, you could, you could turn the computer into a botnet and leverage that for attacks or spam. You could pull off um, someone's credit card information or personal information and use that. But there's not a direct monetization path. On mobile, that's not the case. You're directly tied to your cell phone bill. And there's lots of different ways you can spend money. So reverse SMS billing, I'm sure there's, uh, you, when you buy applications, there's all sorts of different methodologies there. So mobile, for the first time ever, you send a packet, we can actually send a packet, and money goes flying. And that's new, and that's a really big deal. I mean, if you can imagine a payload that sends a packet and money goes flying to some offshore account, that's a, that's a big deal. Sir, I don't know how I can underscore enough how important this is. Imagine if you could just send a UDP packet and like a dollar goes into your account. Like, think about that. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, this, you know, from, a, from an attack monetization strategy, kids in the mall, uh, you know, large worms, there, there's a lot of potential for very, very bad things here. And the, the major fraud mitigation uh, technique is when we see something bad, we'll stop it. Yep. So privileged ac access to network resources. I don't know how many of you are responsible for corporate uh, networks, enterprise networks, but you can spend a ton of money and a ton of effort securing your actual network perimeter. But then if your mobile device is vulnerable and has a uh, trusted relationship with your corporate network, let's say a VPN in, well, I hit the softest spot, use that as a leverage point into the corporate network itself. That's pretty nasty. And then finally, valuable data. I mean, your mobile device is, is the most personal computer, in my opinion. There's a ton of information rel relative to your social graph, who you're talking to, just running an analysis on your text messages, your calls. You can learn a lot about a person, location data, and then all sorts of other personal information. Mobile's a really hard problem. So. We have to deal with performance in, in terms of battery life, processing power, and defending mobile devices. And, and we're constrained on the defensive side, but attackers are not. So the attacks are only getting more advanced, and they're not constrained. One of the big problems is also, uh, a lot of people will argue, oh, there's not going to be big mobile threats because the operating system landscape is very fragmented. I would d argue against that, and I'll tell you why. So. Yes, there's fragmentation between operating systems, but smartphone operating systems are growing, all of them, so rapidly that they're all extremely large. So I believe there's maybe 17 million iPhones. And yes, that's fragmented, but there's 17 million iPhones. And mobile devices, in many ways, are more consistent than PCs. So a Windows box is not necessarily a Windows box. There's different ports open, different configurations, different types of software. iPhones, pretty much, as far as the outside world is concerned, are all the same. So if I have one attack, I can use that attack against 17 million devices. That's pretty sweet. So you look at the frag it's fragmented yet consistent, and that's a nuance that I would point out that's it's important. And then responding to the threats is really challenging. So the real elephant under the rug here, and I'm not sure if everybody realizes this, is that 
adding on top of pl platform fragmentation is update fragmentation. So let's say I have uh, this uh, mobile device from HTC, it's supported by 100 carriers worldwide. If there's a firmware update that needs to go out to patch a vulnerability, every single carrier has to requalify the firmware to make sure it doesn't take down devices, they're not getting service calls, it's a, it's a huge pain for them. So this is not just like on Windows where we can push out an out-of-band Windows update, an emergency patch. They actually have to go through a lengthy cycle and if you touch radio code, the respective regulatory body has to um, uh, requalify it, so the FCC in our case. So imagine you find an exploit, then they go to patch it, you have to have it requalified by all the carriers and the FCC. This this takes months and months. I mean, it's an inordinate amount of time. And I mean, a great example, we'll talk a little bit more about it. Um, we found a zero day in the iPhone uh, in Bluetooth STP. Um, in the right when the iPhone came out, worked with Apple. It took about four months from when we first reported to them to get patched. That was actually really, really fast for mobile. So the way that we are approaching this problem is we're trying to do our best to work with vendors, operators, to try and give them as much lead time as possible. And I highly advise that everyone else who's doing mobile security research do so as well um, in the interest of the end user. S yeah, standard vulnerability disclosure timelines like six weeks or you know a couple months is just doesn't work in mobile. When you have to deal with you know, 133 internal QA cycles, 133 FCC QA cycles, and 133 uh, carrier calls, you know, four months is, is freaking flying. So let's talk a little bit about vulnerability discovery. You have context about how we think about the mobile landscape. Um, let's talk about how we actually discover mobile vulnerabilities, then we can look at auditing and attacking. So uh, auditing a mobile device, it's not really much different. I mean, it is, but you kind of start uh, with the code. Um, uh, and there's a lot of the same problems that we had back in the day uh, with desktop software. Uh, you're looking for your stir copies, um, pointer manipulation, uh, stuff like that. Uh, also your uh, execution calls like exec VE and that whole family system uh, with user supplied arguments. And we, we, we've all known about these problems obviously for the past 10 years, uh, but the mobile industry, uh, securities, they, they haven't had to worry about it before, so they haven't had to program with uh, these things in mind. <coughs> Um, uh, another thing that you can uh, check for when auditing this stuff, uh, also the same as desktop software, is uh, third-party libraries. Um, there's a lot of stuff like a Android alone, I believe, is using like 70 uh, third-party libraries uh, in their build. Um, iPhone had problems with uh, libtiff. Uh, I know the very first uh, Android vulnerability that was found by Alfredo Ortega was in libbmp and libpng and this is back when it was still just an SDK and there was no hardware released uh, and they got that fixed. Um, but it, it kind of goes back to the patching problem uh, that is, it's a lot harder for, for mobile uh, carriers and OEMs and manufacturers to keep their third party libraries in sync with the latest releases and to keep that stuff patched. So just to add to that point, I mean when you, when you think about Okay, so there's open source software on a device like an Android device. They have to code freeze to ship, to go send it to market and put it in boxes and deal with all this. During that time, if there's a vulnerability in one of the open source libraries that they leveraged, they, those devices in the boxes are now sitting vulnerable and until they can issue a patch, there's this complete uh, mi mismatch of, of the software that in the real world versus the software on devices. Super big problem. So just looking at change sets is, a, is an interesting way to find lots of vulnerabilities. But John, you can just upgrade the libraries yourself, right? <laughs> so uh, a, a less traditional route, I thought we'd just add this is interesting. We've actually found some um, not directly vulnerabilities through Twitter. So security researchers love talking and uh, we found a number of folks talking about the types of research that they're doing, been able to look at little snippets of what they're saying, work our way backwards, reverse engineer their, their research and actually find the vulnerabilities faster. So um, just looking at different, t uh, Twitter search is amazing, just go in and start searching for different keywords around auditing or mobile vulnerabilities or any type of vulnerabilities in general. Uh, you might be surprised what you'll find. So let's talk about how we actually audit mobile devices. So we're really excited. Uh, we have a fuzzing tool to release. Uh, it's specifically targeted towards mobile devices. And we found one of the problems with actually securing mobile devices is uh, the companies who develop a software for mobile devices, the companies who make handsets, and the companies who make operating systems, uh, some of them have tools they use internally, but it's actually remarkably hard to really get good security coverage on mobile devices. And so we said, you know what, we think we can help this. And 
We are going to release a fuzzing tool. I assume everyone here knows what fuzzing is, hopefully. Um, and really what we mean by a fuzzing tool is not just something that generates bad data, but also something that handles the injection, the state management, and the result analysis, uh, which is one of the hardest parts about dealing with mobile because you have a lot of protocols that you have to inject on the device specifically or through some sort of radio. So we're, we're pretty happy with that. Uh, it's going to be free and open source. And we really have uh, hopes and dreams that people actually use this and help contribute back to this. Has anyone here heard of uh, the site GitHub? <laughs> one guy. At, at least one guy. <laughs> so, so let me paint a picture. You're at DEF CON. You go and they, somebody on stage says, hey, we have a really cool security tool. You know, you've probably seen this happen like 20, 30 times. And uh, how often does that actually get updated? The answer is maybe once, and that's a week after DEF CON while they're still interested in the tool. And so that's not what we want to do here. We, we actually want to have something that you all can take home. If you're at a mobile company or any company in general and you like hacking on uh, mobile phones, you can contribute stuff back. And really what we hope to have is a baseline security that all mobile phones can have before they ship. Because there are just too many silly vulnerabilities that you know, we find 10 test cases in into the dumbest fuzzer we can possibly write that just do, do not need to exist. So that's, that's what we hope to do here. So the first thing you'll note is um, in our fuzzer, it's written in Ruby. Uh, and we can have some arguments over whether this domain-specific language is good. But the idea is that we want to make fuzzing very, very easy for anyone to do. You don't want to have to think about all the underlying goo. You just want to say, here's what a protocol looks like. And here's this phone. So just do your worst and do it all automatically and tell me what happens. Um, it, so basically, we have. Uh, a domain-specific language that generates fuzzers and automatically handles generating all of the bad data that you would inject to actually elicit vulnerabilities in mobile devices. So some of the problems, and you might ask, well, why did you create a new fuzzer? There's a whole bunch of wonderful fuzzers out there. Uh, mobile devices use a lot more than TCP IP. You have Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, NFC, et cetera, et cetera. There's all sorts of different protocols that are they're fairly difficult to deal with, and with, with normal fuzzers. Uh, injection constraints. The protocols themselves are kind of nasty, and so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. The, the first thing that is important in building a mobile fuzzer is everything has to be overridable. You know, and, and you might just say this is good software architecture, but you really want anything to be swapped out because I can't tell you how many times we're auditing some you know, just weird, strange phone, and it doesn't support X, X, or X. And it's just really annoying. And so being able to swap everything out is, is important. Um, go ahead. So the, the, the Basically, the, the way this, this fuzzer is built is, um, if you're familiar with fuzzers, there, there's a block and there's elements inside of the block. And so basically, you just describe protocols like this. So let's imagine you have a, uh, like a, a type length value protocol. You would say, hey, the type's an integer. The, the length is a length, which is also an integer, over this binary value. And you describe that, and all of your test cases are just generated for you. The other thing that's nice is that we want to make it very, very easy to mix and match protocols. So basically, once you define a given protocol, you add it to this registry, and uh, you can basically reference it later. And protocols use something called an abstract data element that allows them to attach together. So you may describe TCP IP, but you want to fuzz HTTP on top of that. The, the TCP protocol will have a, a data element, and you just attach uh, HTTP to that. And what this buys us and you, is you can do things like this. So straight from the command line, you can just combine protocols together, and on the fly, a test case will be generated in this whole fuzzing suite. And so our goal is to say, yeah, at some point, you say, I want to audit this iPhone. And it will take all the protocols it knows about and throw everything it does at the iPhone, which is, which is pretty neat. And so if you want to add one more thing to your test case, it will add that protocol. Uh, you can leverage, say, somebody's already done all of the crazy GSM SMS stuff, and you want to add it one WAP protocol. All you do is have to write that WAP protocol and say, hey, fuzz iPhone, uh, GSM SMS, WAP, WTLS, for example. And everything is just done for you. So. Uh, a lot of mobile phones have emulators and simulators. If anyone's done iPhone development, it, 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 the simulator is, you know, it runs on x86, so it's not really going to do much for us. Windows Mobile is a pretty good uh, emulator, and Symbian I don't think is a very good simulator. But really, we need to touch physical hardware. Um, if, you're, if you're fuzzing Bluetooth or SMS or uh, Wi-Fi or even just uh, things that are on the device, 
different OEMs put different pieces of software on their phones, and you never know what's going to happen. We've found bugs that are in you know, the Broadcom Bluetooth stack on one phone, and then this other phone uses the Microsoft Bluetooth stack. So we really just need to touch physical devices. And so the solution here is we have these pre-built injectors that, that it will work on uh, each platform and interface. And, and what you can see is that just from the command line, you can say, I want to fuzz these protocols, and here's the injector you want to use to uh, inject it. Uh, and so we, we, ha we have a, a common injector protocol. And so there's basically two types of injectors we use. One is the, hey, here's a local injector that interacts with the radio. And that radio will inject all this data at a phone. But the other type is, let's imagine you have an iPhone and you want to fuzz the, uh, you know, the libtiff library, for example. Uh, how, how do you do that? You know, one way is to set up a, an HTTP server and just have it hit it all the time. The other way is to have a piece of software running on the phone that takes input from the fuzzing server and will actually load all those libraries with libtiff. And even better, you can have local debugging resources so you can run GDB locally, for example, so you can actually get really, really good result analysis. And basically what we've built is a, uh, a, a standard protocol by which anyone can write a injector for a phone. So right now we have iPhone and Android injectors and more are coming soon. We have a Bluetooth one just about ready and so we're going to release all this and basically because it's a common protocol, uh, anyone can write their own injector. It's super trivial. Um, so we're happy with it. Uh, so basically what happens is uh, the fuzzing host says, hey, here's a type of data, for example, an SMS or an image or audio so the injector knows what to do with it. Here's the length, and we, we just let's assume you're not going to play with that, uh, and the data that you're going to fuzz. Uh, the, the injector that runs on the physical device takes that, runs it, and will return a result. So uh, one of the injections we wrote for the iPhone, uh, we want to fuzz uh, SMS PDUs. Uh, so just to give you an idea of how these things work, um, on the iPhone, uh, we wanted to fuzz uh, the comm center binary, which basically it's a uh, it's executed what runs as root and it does all the parsing of the SMS PDUs. So what we did was uh, we wrote a dynamic library uh, to basically do kind of a, essentially like an LD preload on Linux type thing. Um, and we would intercept all the reads, writes, and the uh, select calls on all the basebands. Uh, the S SPI basebands 2, 3, and 4 are the ones that handle all the SMS um, coming in. Uh, so the way we did this was we had a name pipe um, that, well, so we had a standalone binary running as the injector. Uh, we would send uh, our fuzz packets at that. Um, that would stuff them into a name pipe and the uh, dynamic library that was hooking all of these calls, uh, it would basically take that name pipe file descriptor that it had open and stuff that into the uh, FD set for select. Uh, along with all the baseband uh, file descriptors. Um, so when data was coming in on that, select would unblock and then we would look at that and say, okay, is our name pipe set? Uh, and at that point we could flip the bit and say that there's, there's data coming in off the baseband when there really wasn't. Um, at that point then select, or we would pass that on to the comm center. Comm center would try to do a read on that baseband and then we would intercept that as well and actually read from our name pipe rather than the baseband device. Uh, so from there we could stuff that all in the buffer and then comp center would think that it got the data that it wanted and then we could uh, fuzz everything through that. And then we just use a simple state machine to keep track because there's the, the three different baseband's that it's reading from uh, that it basically reads from to with a ATXDVRI and a CMT and then it writes a uh, ATCNMA to check if it actually got one. So with our hooked write, we would actually swallow that and say that we uh, wrote that to the baseband and then fake a reply back uh, rather than letting it actually reply. So basically we man in the middle the uh, radio on the iPhone. Yes, simple <laughs> terms. Um, and a nice side effect of this too, uh, once we release this, you can use this uh, to actually monitor all the activity that's going on on these basebands with this code and have that log it out, uh, or log that to the screen. And if uh, Tom Robinson from 280 North is here, he pioneered this original technique we were doing with some Bluetooth stuff, so thanks a lot, Tom. The yeah. code is good. I would also recommend checking out um, a couple of the talks from Black Hat, uh, Colin and Charlie uh, did some similar research on SMS and they, they had a pretty good prezo, so I checked that out too. So uh, let's take a look at a fuzzing demo uh, of the iPhone. I, that's not how it's supposed to look. Um, 
This is good. So, Anthony. Okay, so uh, just to give you an idea, this um, you can hear the SMSs coming in incredibly fast. So instead of manually testing, we can just send obscene amounts of SMS traffic at the device without going over the SMS network. So it sounds like we're winning every time it pings. Yeah. <laughs> and let me tell you, the, the carriers don't really like it when you fuzz SMS over the real network. Yeah, don't do yeah, that. Don't, that's a bad you, idea. You don't might do take that. down a cell tower. Yeah, you're, you're probably more <laughs> likely to take keep, down the keep network. Keep it local. <laughs> So, so uh, we just sent 300 uh, PDUs. You this should, you test suite has closer. about 300,000. There are seven <laughs> test suites, and it's telling me there's about 500 minutes left on this test. Cool. Okay, so fuzzing. Uh, here, can you turn the fuzzer off? It's going crazy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this software that we're releasing can run uh, basically anywhere on a laptop, on a desktop. But you, we run into problems in terms of uh, actually power and throughput. Um, and also, we want to be able to massively parallelize protocols. So if we're doing SMS, we want to be able to fuzz Bluetooth and Wi-Fi at the same time. We built a distributed fuzzing cluster, uh, I'll note, in a TSA-friendly compliant <laughs> case, so, but traveling with it's an adventure. Um, <laughs> Not a bomb. It, so it works, uh, <laughs> it, it works extremely well at fuzzing devices uh, massively concurrently. So we can, uh, you can see in the picture, there's maybe 10 devices there. We have a bunch set up here. We could have 50 phones plugged into this thing be simultaneously fuzzing Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, uh, uh, SMS, a bunch of protocols all at the same time. Tons of throughput. There's 16 cores in this thing. It's super powerful. So um, it's just a hardware implementation, and we like hardware a lot. So um, this is an uh, example of taking the open source project that we're going to be releasing and extending it to something even more powerful. And th this, this wasn't that. We did this in a weekend, so this is pretty easy to set up. Mobile protocols are, in fact, evil. Um, if you've ever had a chance to read uh, some of the ETSI specs or the 3GPP specs or the OMA specs, my condolences. Um, you, the, the, the reason for this is basically you, we need a lot of efficiency on mobile networks because bandwidth equals money and lots of it. So there's all sorts of really weird techniques and there's a lot of bit masking involved for like arbitrary, arbitrary width length fields with a high bit set and it just, it's just crazy. Um, this allows also a lot of state transitions. Like for example, if you ever had a chance to look at the L2 cap uh, connection state transitions, there there are way too many like states in that diagram. It, it's it's almost nuts. Um, and so one of the reasons for developing this mobile fuzzer is actually to be able to deal with all of these crazy protocol elements and state transitions and things like that in a way that w will not make us go crazy trying to override this, that, or the other. So. Uh, Important, first of all, is intelligent defaults. You create an int element, it says, you know what, I'm going to be a one byte int element. Not that Indianness matters, but if you said, hey, I want a two byte int element, it will default to big Indian too. Um, you know, I, I'm kind of a Ruby on Rails junkie, so, you know, the, the concept of uh, convention over configuration speaks very truly to me. Uh, so, sec second of all, let's imagine you want to, for some reason, have a three byte little Indian uh, integer. It will create that for you. Uh, the other nice thing is that uh, you notice that we don't actually have to define what values we're fuzzing, right? Um, if you've looked at fuzzers such as Sully or other fuzzers, they usually have a corpus of data. So for example, if I'm fuzzing an integer, you want to try to uh, trigger boundary condition issues. So this is the standard 0, 0, 7F, 8, 0, uh, FF, et cetera. And then you probably want to do off by ones on that. And you know, from, from fuzzing history, that's what's most likely to cause errors. Um, but nobody wants to define that every time. Like, oh, I have to do a three byte in, or a three a three byte integer. I have to redefine all those values. Uh, the system will automatically figure out how big your thing is and make the Indianess all just work. So uh, o overriding uh, thing, so overriding anything is, is certainly important. Um, this specific overriding is this crazy way. Uh, it's Og does. Uh, it's called lacing, but it's basically a glorified length field system. Uh, there, there, there is a, a typo on here, so just assume that v is the same as value. Um, basically, if you have an integer, there are umpteen different ways you need to encode it. And if you, we had to write a, a whole different block, a whole new class on the system to handle that integer, we'd just go crazy. So basically, the system allows you to dynamically override uh, the encoders. And there's, there's all sorts of kind of pre-built hooks that make it easy to just inject some extra logic. And because we know in mobile protocols, you always have to change this stuff. So the, the thing we're actually really excited about is there's this concept of how deep do you fuzz versus how long does it take. And the two degrees of freedom there are 
Uh, I have an element. How many values can it take? For example, an integer can take 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, you know, et cetera. And then the other is if I have 10 elements, how do I combine those two value, those, those values together? For example, I have, do I fuzz all of the first element, then fuzz all of the next element? Uh, if you do that, it can take a really, really long time. So there, there are two ways that fuzzers have dealt with this at the pa in the past. The first is the, the one at a time method. And so basically what that means is you take a good PDU, let's imagine an HTTP request, and you break that into blocks. You say, okay, here's the, here's the verb, you know, the post, get, delete, put, et cetera. Uh, here's the URL, here's the version of HTTP, uh, here's all the headers. And what you would do is each one of those blocks has all sorts of fuzzed values, and you, one at a time, you manipulate that, that, that block and say, I'm gonna try this bad value, this bad value, this bad value. This has the advantage of you can go really, really deep in any given value. Um, but the problem is, is that it doesn't uncover values where you have two things you're fuzzing at the time. At a time, for example, let's say you had a type length value protocol, and you just fuzz the length, but the vulnerability lies in fuzzing both the type and the length at the same time. You're not going to find that bug. So the other type of ways is is basically you combine all of the different types of blocks together. And so basically, what this means is, if you have three values, you combine all possible values of all poss all the three elements together, but when you uh, combine lots and lots and lots of elements together, you know, imagine multiplying 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times, you know, you, you see where this goes and you have like 14 quadrillion test cases. And basically, you know, it'll finish in somewhere near the lifetime of the universe. Um, and and we, we found this. We just, a simple protocol can just explode. Also, uh, if you're only limited to 10 values for a given element, you know, you're, you're not fuzzing that much. So, so the, the technique we're introducing here is uh, progressively ch uh, incrementing the amount of combination we're doing. And so basically what that means is we have two sets of values for any given element. There's a expected value, for example, with HTTP, that would be you know, put, get, delete, etc. cetera, uh, and a set of fuzz values, which would be all of the, the crazy, wonderful strings that you're trying to do to elicit fail in what you're testing. Um, as we test, we want to increase the, the amount of elements we're combining together with their fuzz values. And here, here's a little example. So imagine you have a, a, a protocol of four elements. You, you start with fuzzing one thing at a time, and then the rest take their normal values, and it'll iterate through all of that. After you exhaust all of those, that, that is what we're saying is the most likely to find a bug is just fuzzing one thing. But then after we exhaust those, then you go to two at a time. And so you fuzz two values and iterate through all that. And the cool thing is, is that you could technically leave this indefinitely. You can go three at a time, four at a time, five at a time, and you know, somewhere around six at a time for any reasonably complex protocol, you're never gonna finish. But you know, that's why we build things like this, so we can just kind of leave it going all, all day long. Um, and also don't worry, the, the math is a little scary when you have you know, lots of elements and then they have different numbers of values and fuzzed values, and so just don't open the fuzzer class if you don't wanna look at that math. Okay. TCP IP is very well encapsulated. You know, what, what's the last time you've seen an HTTP vulnerability resulting in some weird HD, uh, TCP flag? And you know, it, it can happen, but mobile protocols are very, very leaky. One example of this is WAP. Authentication mechanisms way up the stack are based on uh, addresses way down the stack. Uh, similar with Bluetooth. Authentication mechanisms way up the stack are based on things way down the stack. And so in fuzzing mobile, you, you don't just want to fuzz the, the top level protocol you want to talk about. You want to fuzz this entire thing. And ordinarily, if we, you couldn't do that because it would take forever. But with this progressively combinatorial system, you can, you can actually, re in reasonable time, fuzz a lot of these protocols together. Another really cool thing we're excited about is let's imagine you're fuzzing a complicated protocol with lots of state transitions. You actually have to implement that protocol. And that, that's usually not fun. But because we have fuzzers, we've already implemented that protocol. So you can, we just reuse these data structures to actually generate and parse uh, data, da the data structures for the protocol and it makes life easy. You know, I, I don't want to rewrite an entire protocol and I don't think any of you guys do either. So uh, around iPhone 1.0 time, we uh, took an early version of this fuzzer and uh, targeted it against the iPhone. <laughs> and there were, were some interesting issues, you know, this is, this was a SDP vulnerability. SDP and Bluetooth is a way for enumerating services that are on a Bluetooth device. And we found that in, in this one specific case, uh, a weird element type, so there's this uh, concept in SDP where you have one byte that specifies both the length and the type of the data to follow. And 
it's 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 kind of funny when you're when you're writing fuzzers. It's, it's it's usually a good idea to put yourself in the mindset of somebody who's writing the protocol and what you would probably screw up. And you know that's what we did. And you know, look, they they screwed up the same thing we thought we would screw up. I um, think we found this vulnerability in the first five minutes of fuzzing. Uh, it was a little bit longer than that, but yeah, it was it was very very early. Um, and so basically, what what the result of this was is we would get a uh, you know a kernel read to f f f f f f f f and uh, and we uh, disclosed this to Apple and. Uh, we didn't actually try to weaponize this, but the, you know the feedback we have is that it, it could have been bad had had this been found. And so uh, that took about four months to fix, as, as John said. And, you know, if something like this were to be found and weaponized, you know, four months is quite a long time to be vulnerable. So there's another vulnerability we found. Um, this is similar to the vulnerability we demonstrated earlier. Uh, it, it's it's also in WAP. It's also a result of misconfigured security policies uh, coming from the carrier. And basically what this allows you to do is uh, push uh, something called a WAP provisioning document. This is something that the carriers use to do like everything on the phone. This is configuring proxy settings. This is uh, hard resetting your device, edit, accessing <laughs> your files. Like this, if you go look at the Microsoft documentation, there's basically nothing you can't do. Um, yeah. Uh, the, the good thing about this attack is that Basically, it's the same sort of idea that it doesn't validate the source of the push message. And what we speculate is that carriers, say you have two giant carriers coming together and they had different push proxy gateways, and if they had to change the trust model on all their phones, it would just be a really hairy nightmare. And so they just say, no, we're just going to trust all web push at all. Um, and so what, what this vulnerability requires is that you need to sign the message with a network pin, which is the IMSI of your phone. It's, it's a number that's written on the back of your SIM card or oftentimes the receipt when you go to your carrier store. So make sure that sort of information doesn't get out. Uh, we do recommend that people do uh, you know, run the fix tool that will, fit, that will patch this and you won't be vulnerable. Uh, we disclosed this to Microsoft in late 2008 and the, the OEMs are aware of this and it's very, very prevalent. So let's talk a little bit more about attacking mobile devices now. So uh, <clears throat> we're going to paint a picture of the mobile landscape uh, as far as attacking goes. Uh, it's what we like to call the 1999 factor because the state of mobile security right now uh, as far as the, the code goes is very, very similar to how code was back in the late 90s uh, if any of you are, did any hacking back then. Um, so uh, we didn't have a heap in uh, stack protections back then. x86 back in the day did not have uh, uh, non-executable bits uh, for pages. Um, ARM does. They, they have the uh, XN bit, uh, the execute never bit. But uh, a, lot of, a, a lot of mobile operating systems are not using this currently. Um, there's, in fact, the only one I could think of, uh, or actually, we, we have our, yeah, OK. Cool. Um, so here's our obligatory matrix of what is and isn't on these things. Um, address, space, address space layout randomization. Uh, currently, Android is the only one using that uh, on their stack. Uh, no one else is randomizing their heap stack or library loading. Um, Windows Mobile uses stack cookies, uh, but it's only a 16-bit cookie on the stack. So I can't imagine it would be terribly hard to brute force that cookie. Uh, Android does use uh, stack cookies. Um, and then the iPhone is using uh, like non-executable permissions on their pages for the, the stack and the heap. And they actually have uh, extremely strict permissioning uh, with their memory to the point where you cannot have a page that is uh, both writable and executable at the same time. It'll cause an exception. Um, but you can, you can still get around that with return to libc. Uh, as far as signing code goes, uh, iPhone, obviously, we all know that they require it to be signed. Windows Mobile, uh, they do have a, they do use signed code for their applications, but they will allow unsigned code to run, uh, but it will present you with a, some user interaction prompt, yes or no, if you want to install this, whereas I believe signed code will just install without that. Android doesn't use um, signed code for their applications in the market. Uh, but and they use kind of a block known bad, not allow known good type thing. Um, but th the good thing is that things are things are getting better. Uh, within the past year or so, uh, the iPhone I know they've they've gone from having everything running as root with uh, 
no uh, permissionings in their memory to now they have their segregated mobile user account and these uh, strict memory permissions. But for the most for the most part, security is kind of an afterthought for a lot of mobile developers. They've never had to worry about this problem before, and it's understandable. No one's been attacking it in the past because there's been nothing to gain. Um, so we'll uh, talk about some specific uh, things on each platform. Um, on the iPhone, unlocking is very common. A lot of people don't want to use an iPhone on AT&T. Um, and we, we now have the uh, push uh, notification services uh, that everyone's using for uh, notification of IMs coming in because uh, iPhone doesn't allow background processing or background processes. Uh, the push notification is based on the XMPP uh, publish subscribe uh, protocol, um, which is basically used for Jabber IM. Uh, and they use SSL certs basically as user IDs uh, for each device when you activate uh, your iPhone. Um, it generates a uh, public private key. Uh, but the problem with these is that. Uh, with these unlocked phones, uh, when you activate them, it's not generating a key for you to use the uh, push notifications. And so the way they solved that was uh, basically copying the uh, private key that was generated onto all these unlocked phones. Uh, so this is a problem that uh, was all over the uh, internet for a little while. Everybody thought it was Apple's fault at first, but then they realized it was the fault of these unlocked phones. And people started getting uh, instant message uh, push notifications that were destined for other people. And it's been speculated they'd be able to use this for like spamming uh, mass push notifications. Um, another problem with the iPhone is, well, I, I guess, the uh, App Store, um, which is basically a centralized location for getting applications on your phone. Um, they released their SDK so that everybody could start developing applications for it. Uh, but the SDK basically uh, it encouraged a lot of uh, first-time developers to start jumping in and working on this. And a lot of these first-time programmers have no concept of security whatsoever. Uh, all this, uh, all the the code for the iPhone is running native. Uh, but luckily, it's running as the uh, mobile user, uh, so it doesn't have root privileges. Um, Another thing is the jailbreaking. A lot of people were doing this back in the day, not so much uh, recently because of the App Store. Um, but jailbreaking actually turns off code signing, and it makes it a lot easier to do a lot of exploitation on the iPhone. Um, so with Android, uh, everyone was stoked that Android was, well, it's kind of stoked, uh, that everything was running in a VM. And each process is a sandbox. Uh, basically, Java uh, gets compiled down to Dalvik bytecode. Um, but not everything on Android is actually running as Java. Uh, the VM itself is native code. Um, and then it also supports JNI, uh, the Java native interface, to be able to run uh, native compiled code for like optimizations. Um, Till recently, it was unsupported. Uh, then they just released their NDK, so now everybody can start using that. Uh, it, it doesn't really support the many libraries, but it's pretty easy to compile your own libraries, and that kind of goes back to the problem of third-party libraries of a lot of these first-time developers have no clue uh, about these problems. Um, so we did look for some vulnerabilities in the uh, Dalvik VM, because we figured that's, that's a good place to get some code execution. Uh, one of the ones that we found uh, that we can disclose is in the uh, JDWP, which is the uh, Java Debug Wireless Protocol. Um, it's in the DVM debug output array, uh, which basically just outputs an array to uh, the console. Um, it, it was basically just a textbook uh, integer overflow in it. Um, and it's, it's not really a problem because it is in the debugging stuff, but a lot of the dev phones, which was the first hardware released with uh, Android on it, uh, they actually have a lot of listening uh, or processes with listening JDWP ports that are just sitting there. Uh, but luckily, this, this uh, vulnerability we found isn't actually exploitable in the wild because of the amount of memory that's required to copy. But in the future, there, I mean, there's a lot of talk about having Android on netbooks, and that could actually become a problem. It's also pretty interesting. Uh, Android's permission model is, is such that 
the process is the isolation, not the JVM. So a mm -hmm. lot of times Java security is based on like if you can break out of the JVM, you win. That's not so in yeah. Android. They just assume you ha you're just the Unix process, so it's it's good. Um, also, the same same thing with the uh, Android market. They have a, a lot of similar things with the iPhone. Just like first time developers uh, that really have no concept of security, and they don't really have to worry about that. And also without sign code. Um, yeah. So Windows Mobile. Uh, current versions of Windows Mobile since uh, I think it's 5.0 at least, uh, based on the WinCE 5 kernel. And basically, what this means is it's one giant 32-bit address space. There's actually no process-level memory isolation. Um, it, it, it's kind of neat. This stuff you can do. Uh, threads migrate from process to process. Um, of, of particular note is that SMS parsing is done in the kernel in a privileged process. You know, it's similar to iPhone, and that's usually not a good thing. Um, if you were to exploit that, you can basically touch any memory on any process in the entire system, including the kernel, so yikes. Uh, Windows Mobile 7 is uh, getting actual true process memory isolation, so that, that is good. So uh, there have been a few Windows Mobile vulnerabilities we can talk about. Uh, uh, we found a vulnerability in Broadcom's Bluetooth stack. Uh, we actually drove down to San Diego and sat with their engineers and like showed them how and got them to fix it. That was pretty cool. Um, but basically, it allowed. Uh, I think it was just a really textbook uh, buffer overflow. Um, it just you know it's silly that we're still seeing these types of things in code. You know, in what 2006, seven we discovered that. Uh, Colin Mulliner a couple years ago at DEF CON, if any of you guys saw that MMS vulnerability, uh, basically was able to get remote code execution on one mode device by sending it a carefully crafted MMS. And uh, if you guys pay attention to the news, there was a Bluetooth vuln in some HTC devices recently. Um, basically, that directory traversal on the FTP, so basically you can just get out of the, the FTP jail. You know, we're, we're starting to see vulnerabilities on mobile phones. Yeah. And like I said, that, that vulnerability was not actually in Windows Mobile. It was in the uh, drivers that HTC was shipping. So that, that's a really important point. Uh, OS vendors, OEMs, ISVs, they all have software on the phones. And any one of them can be vulnerable. So it, it's important to just don't blame the carrier, vendor, et cetera. It's, it's not always their fault. Cool. So let's uh, wrap up with talking about defending mobile devices, what we can do. So there's uh, four pieces of the puzzle in the way we like to think about it. There's absolutely no silver bullet to defending mobile devices. Um, software security, device security, network security, and end user security are all going to be super important if we actually want to make an impact on keeping these things safe. So it, it absolutely all starts with the software. And this isn't just... OEMs or OS vendors or the operators. This is also application developers. So I'm sure a ton of you have built iPhone or Android apps. It's super important that everybody involved is aware of developing secure code. It's really, really important. Um, it's the whole death by a thousand cuts idea is, is, is that if we have tons and tons of apps that are insecure, it's going to uh, expose the devices themselves to vulnerabilities. Device security, also something that's incredibly important. The uh, OEMs and the OS vendors are going to need to take that really seriously. Network security is tied to device security, so we're going to see the carriers filtering a lot of uh, SMS type attacks, which is good. But at the end of the day, things will still slip through. So if the devices themselves are vulnerable, that's not going to help us. And then end user security. So th there's this interesting concept we found that there are lots of vulnerabilities for mobile that do get patched. We're seeing it more and more with the iPhone, for example. Almost every uh, update that you see. If you go look in the uh, in the documentation, there's vulnerabilities. But then there's a ton of folks who, who charge their iPhone in the wall at night and don't sync with iTunes that often. So in fact, stay out of date. Many versions behind. They're not as excited as many of us are to upgrade to the latest version, and hence are vulnerable to scores of vulnerabilities. And this is more common than you would think. Actually, keeping the, the firmware on your mobile device up to date, patched, and most people really don't think about this. It's extremely important. So everybody else, software developers, device security, network security, everybody can do their job, and then the end user doesn't do their job and, and is vulnerable. So at the end of the day, uh, we have to make sure that we keep our own devices safe as well and, and, and participate. So what you can do to take action, like I said, uh, ensure your latest firmware or software uh, is up to date. That's really important. Enable only essential services and protocols. Uh, while you're here at DEF CON, my advice is airplane mode or just don't bring your phone. That's probably the safest bet. Um, but if you have to, leave Bluetooth off, leave Wi-Fi off, be cognizant of your surroundings. I would say that this is definitely probably the most hostile environment for a mobile device you could possibly be in in any <laughs> short period of time. 
um, verify any software you have deployed. This matters less for end users, but if any of you guys are IT admins, uh, watch out for software that your users are actually installing on their own because that can cause a lot of problems and introduce vulnerabilities into your deployment. And uh, establish a system to monitor mobile vulnerability disclosure and information. We've built some pretty cool tools just to keep up with um, the variety of information that's flowing out there on mobile vulnerability. So we have um, Twitter feeds, we have uh, things that scrape all the different disclosure areas and aggregate them into a single place so we can actually see you know, what researchers are talking about mobile, what vulnerability disclosures are happening, everything in one place and be super on top of what's going on. So um, thank you very much, we appreciate all of it. I want to thank Microsoft, uh, the BlackBerry security team, Google, Android and Apple.